Thanks for joining us today, everyone. Um, we'll get started in just another minute. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're going to take care of some housekeeping first. So for those of you participating, use the chat box to ask questions at any time. Uh, at the end, we'll also leave plenty of time for questions. And the webinar will be recorded and archived online, so you can watch again later. Great, so today's webinar is about three policy influencers to know and how they'll be shaping the 2019 policy landscape. So today's speakers are me, Laura Lyon, Carissa Bundy, and hi, I'm Brittany Webster. So today we're gonna to start with Senator Richard Shelby of Alabama. Next will be Senator Jerry Morin of Kansas, and then we're gonna end with Dr. Kelvin Drogemeyer. So let's get started. Um, first is Richard Shelby, and he's significant because he's currently the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee. So a bit about the Appropriations Committee. Um, in Congress, it is the largest uh, in the Senate with 31 members, um, and it's also one of the most important committees. So through the appropriations process, um, senators fund the entire federal government, and these are the only bills that Congress must pass, pass every year. There are 12 subcommittees. Um, each will have its own appropriations bill, but there are four that are particularly, particularly important for us when we're looking at science funding. Those are Commerce, Justice, and Science, CJS, which funds NASA, NOAA, and the NSF, Energy and Water, which is in charge of the Department of Energy, Interior and Environment, which is responsible for USGS and the EPA, and finally, Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education, which is responsible for the NIEHS, which is the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. So a bit about um, Senator Shelby's background. He's from Alabama, and he completed his bachelor's and law degree there. Um, he started as a city prosecutor and moved on to the state attorney general's office. After that, he started in politics um, through the Alabama State Senate and was there for eight years. Then he moved on to serve four terms in the U.S. House of Representatives. Since then, uh, 1986 is when he was elected to the Senate, so he's currently on his sixth term in the U.S. Senate. 
Um, in Senate, he actually started as a Democrat and in 1995 switched to the Republican Party. He's been on the Appropriations Committee for over 20 years. So he previously was the chair of the Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, and Science, which has made him an important figure for science funding for a while. Um, in 2008, so earlier this year in April, um, 2018, sorry, he became the chairman of the Appropriations Committee. So um, as the chairman, he's been really focused on clearing individual bills rather than short-term spending bills or omnibus bills. So short-term spending um, is usually referring to continuing resolutions, which just basically carry over the previous fiscal year's um, funding to the next one. Um, and that sort of gives the Senate more, or the Congress more time to create the official appropriation bill. And the omnibus is just like a collection of bills and you just sign off on all of them at once. Um, this has been sort of the method in the previous few years. So um, Shelby has been sort of saying he wants to return things to regular order. So clearing the individual spending bills. Um, for fiscal year 2019, five of the 12 have passed already. And he's actually clearing them at the fastest rate in 30 years. So he's sort of sticking sticking to what he said. Um, a few of his views on science. So he has talked about concern with the EPA and about regulations stifling uh, industry growth. Um, so he sort of wants like a balanced approach to solve environmental issues, but allow for development. Um, when it comes to climate change, he is hesitant about the um, processes behind it and thinks maybe it is natural, not man-made pollutants that are causing this. Um, and when it comes to NASA, he's a very big fan because um, the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center is in Huntsville, Alabama, so he's always been a very big supporter of NASA. Uh, just to see sort of his actions, we have um, the appropriations for the upcoming fiscal year by agency. And um, orange or yellow is the 2018 omnibus spending, and in red is the Senate. So we're sort of focusing mostly on the yellow and the red. And um, just to note that from this, you should see that it's he sort of the stable, um, the Senate's sort of like a stabilizing force. Um, the yellow and the red bars are very close, so they're sort of like they like to keep things consistent, um, and so they don't cut a lot or give a lot. Um, and also important to note the president. Uh, budget request is very low compared to the Senate and House. Um, so they're sort of keeping things consistent and not making major cuts to any of the agencies. Um, NASA's budget is significantly larger than the agencies we've listed, and we'll be discussing um, a bit more about that later. So for Senator Shelby's priorities, um, first off is Alabama. He is very well known for steering funds towards Alabama projects while serving on appropriations, which a lot of senators do when they're on the appropriations committee. Um, an example of this is securing funds for the University of Alabama Huntsville for um, actually climate related research. So trying to find more evidence for public policymakers. Another priority is agriculture. Uh, he supports crop insurance, conservation, nutrition programs, as well as rural development initiatives, which are really important in Alabama, which has a lot of agriculture. For energy, he's um, a big advocate for American energy independence. So he believes in a combined renewable and fossil fuel uh, energy plan using market-based solutions. And for space, as I said before, he's a very strong supporter of NASA. Um, he thinks funding NASA is critically important to keep America competitive in space exploration. An example of um, his support for NASA and Alabama. So in fiscal year 2017, he was able to allocate $2.15 billion of the NASA budget to the space launch system at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And for reference, the uh, budget for NASA that year was $19.7 billion, so not an insignificant portion. So next, we're going to pass it off to Carissa, and we're going to talk about um, Jerry Mor Moran, who actually uh, filled Shelby's position when he moved on to the chairman of appropriations. So, Carissa. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about Senator Moran. He's a Republican from Kansas. Um, and he is um, serving as the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Com Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, Science. So this is the subcommittee that funds NASA, NOAA, and NSF. 
Um, a little bit of background on him. He was born and raised in Plainfield, Kansas. He studied economics at Fort Hayes State University and then went to, on to the University of Kansas. Um, he worked for a short while as a banker, has a lot of um, obviously interest in economics and um, finances. Then he went on to get his JD from the University of Kansas, uh, worked as a lawyer for a little while, and then turned to a career in politics. He served eight years in the Kansas State Senate and then went on to serve seven terms in the U.S. House before he became a senator. So just to give you a little background on the subcommittee that um, Senator Moran is in charge of now, they cover a whole lot other than just science. And they cover a lot of topics that are of extreme interest right now in the political discussions around Washington, um, especially around issues that have to do with J and CJS and justice. Um, folks are really jazzed up a lot about a lot of these topics. So sometimes science gets looped in with very controversial issues that you wouldn't normally associate with science. So the few of the things highlighted here that we are interested in um, we have NASA, NIST, NOAA, um, the National Science Foundation, OSTP, and obviously um, NIST and NOAA are both in the Department of Commerce, which falls under the C of CJS. Um, and another one of these things that is influencing science funding that you may not think is going to influence science funding is the census. So we are coming up on the 2020 census right now, um, and this quote from Senator Moran is from his speech on the floor talking about the FY19 CJS bill. He says, the census is entering a critical state in development as it prepares for the 2020 census. The funding in this bill allows the census to prepare to execute its constitutional responsibilities. So obviously this is a really important thing coming up. Um, and that's just one example of how this very, very broad jurisdiction can impact science. And he is in charge of all of this. Um, I also just wanna note that Senator Moran is also on the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee in the Senate, which is the um, authorizing committee that has to do with a lot of science issues as well. So he's a really, really great person to be tracking because he has a lot of power on a lot of science issues now. Um, a few things I highlighted here, things like marine fisheries, um, aeronautical and space science, oceans, weather, and atmosphere, science engineering and technology, that all covers uh, really the breadth of things that we care about here at AGU. So here's a few things that he has said on science. Now he's been the chair of the subcommittee since April of this year. Um, and in that time, he said quite a few things. This is right after he was uh, tapped to be the chair. He says, I take seriously my role of being a responsible steward of taxpayer dollars. Uh, in particular, he highlights the National Science Foundation and NASA. Um, and he also talks about how he looks forward to conducting oversight. Um, and you can kind of take that as you will. The other things he mentions are things like Kansas, Kansas's economy, which is obviously very important to him, and things like ag, uh, which has a lot of science implications and uses. So he definitely sees the value of science, but I think um, it's interesting that he's excited to conduct oversight. Um, he's also mentioned that he believes NASA provides what no other agency can do to inspire youth to enter STEM fields. And that's important because I will talk about a little later on, he really cares about education. So um, I think STEM ed is a really important thing for him. Um, and this last quote is something he said at a hearing last year on Compete, which is a bill that authorizes funds for NSF. Um, and he asked if all federal research is of equal value or priority. Um, and he says, and I know the answer to that can't be yes, but I also think it probably politically can't be no. And that's in response to this kind of debate about if the federal government should be funding um, basic research versus applied research. So I just think that's a really interesting question that he's throwing out there. Um, so a few of his really big top priorities, um, obviously I mentioned before, agriculture is up there. He is from Kansas. Um, he's always been really active on ag issues when he was in the house. He was instrumental in passing two different farm bills. Um, he's also talked about how concerned he is about the impacts of things like trade wars on businesses and farmers in Kansas. Um, but he's also talked about how much those farmers 
and that agriculture industry relies on NOAA data um, to make sure that they are prepared for whatever is coming. Um, another big priority for him is innovation and job creation. Um, he works bipartisanly with Senator Coons from Delaware to found the Senate Competitiveness Caucus, and that's really aimed at um, just promoting U.S. innovation and competitiveness in the global economy. Um, he also mentions about the FY19 bill that it includes economic development that's so important to a state like Kansas, um, and that even though national statistics say that the economy is doing really well in the U.S., um, that's less likely the case at home. Um, so he really cares about job creation. And then our third priority on here is education, like I mentioned before. Um, and one example of that, and this kind of marries another really big interest for Senator Moran is defense. He worked to pass language in the um, Defense Authorization Act to allow the Department of Defense to build a new elementary school in Fort Riley, which is in Kansas. Um, and then the last thing on here is public health and um, kind of like NIH funding I would put in there. He offered an amendment uh, previously this year that would allow Congress to steer more funding to disease research, um, but that is if the money doesn't, the spending doesn't add to the deficit, which is obviously a really big issue, especially for the Republican Party, not adding to the deficit. But he still called out language um, that would basically ask to increase funding to account for inflation. And that's a big deal for science funding. That's something we talk about all the time, is making sure that the funds that we're putting towards science are accounting for that. So it's just really interesting that he does see the value in that when it comes to things like NIH funding. So, so far in this role, um, what has he done? So, as I mentioned, he became chair of the subcommittee in April. Then in June, they passed the FY19 CJS bill. So, he really hit the ground running. Um, and this is what he had to say about the bill. He says, it maintains strong support for science and innovation by crafting a balanced space program within NASA. Um, it, it contains increased funding for NSF and NOAA and that it really supports the NOAA satellite and data imagery programs, um, things like the weather, National Weather Service, and he specifically calls out um, events like Hurricane Florence, severe flooding throughout the East Coast, and basically how NOAA helps keep Americans safe. So he's actually calling out um, these three science agencies that we really care about in the bill, which is great. Um, so just to kind of give you a close-up view on that graph that Laura was showing you, um, here are kind of where the numbers shake out right now um, for NOAA. So, as you can see, and as Laura mentioned before, um, that purple bar, which is representing the, the Senate CJS proposal, which is the one that Senator Moran is in charge of, is really kind of the stabilizing force between um, the big cuts that we saw in the President's request. Um, and in the House, they, didn't, they still didn't really um, restore that funding to NOAA that they had gotten in FY18. Um, some of this is a little bit skewed because NOAA had some planned decreases in their largest funding item, which is NESDIS, their satellite um, mission area. So um, just keep that in mind. But again, the Senate is really working to restore those cuts that the president had proposed. Um, a similar narrative here with NASA. So um, you'll notice that the House really, really gave NASA a boost um, that's largely because the chair of the CJS subcommittee in the House is Representative Culverson. Um, he is a huge NASA component and is a really big champion for NASA. So that sort of accounts for that there. Um, but still, you know, you still have the Senate really, um, you know, not not much, not far behind the House. Um, still a big supporter of NASA. And again, similar with NSF, um, you know, this 8.2 and 8.1 that we're seeing. Um, funded by the House and the Senate, um, the science community was asking for $8 billion for NSF in 2019. So these are still really, really great numbers for science. So what's to come? Um, so as Laura had mentioned, only you know five of the 12 appropriations bills have passed so far. And uh, some of those seven that haven't passed uh, include the CJS bill. So we are under a CR right now. Um, as far as we know, for CJS until December 7th. In that time, 
the Senate will need to conference with the House and negotiate to pass the remaining seven appropriations bills before then. And if they don't do that, the government will shut down. Now, there's an alternative route here where they do another continuing resolution, and if they want to kick the can down the road even further, they totally can. Um, but if they don't, then we will see a shutdown in December. So how can you engage at this point, um, especially with your members that are involved with appropriations? So um, most immediately, reach out to your legislators, talk to them about the importance of passing these FY19 funding bills before the end of the year um, and before that December deadline, because CRs are not good for science, um, and we really want to see these, these bills happen. Um, so really just push them to make sure that they're trying to get things moving there. Um, secondly, reach out to the relevant committees while they're drafting the next year's funding bills, so the fiscal year 2020 funding bills. That'll usually happen in the spring, so just something you can start to think about now, scheduling meetings with your legislators. Um, and then the last two things on here, um, we really, really invite you to engage with us. Uh, at our action center .org. we have all kinds of opportunities for you to send up letters about funding um, and really stay up to date on things like that. And then finally, if you just want to know what the latest is and get our funding updates um, about where Congress stands right now, you can always sign up for our science policy alerts at sciencepolicy.agu.org. And with that, I will pass it off to Brittany to talk about Dr. Drogemeyer. Thanks, Carissa. Um, so I'm going to give a brief rundown of the importance of OSTP um, and the director of OSTP, and then talk more about Dr. Drogemeyer himself. Um, and just wanted to include this quote, which um, I think speaks well to his understanding of what OSTP does. Um, so OSTP was created in 1976 by Congress, um, and it provides the president and also the rest of the executive office with advice on the impact of science and technology on domestic and international affairs. Um, and a lot of OSCP's work is done through committees and the National Science and Technology Council. And the council is the coordinating body for science and technology across all of the federal government. Um, and just to give you an example of kind of the scope of their work, some recent projects um, that are relevant to AGU and its work include the Space Weather Strategy and Action Plan, as well as the um, National Near-Earth Object Preparedness Strategy and Action Plan, which was just released this summer. So kind of these very big science issues and kind of how is the whole of government going to approach these issues. Um, and additionally, the director of OSTP has traditionally been the president's personal science advisor and someone who's enjoyed a lot of access to the president. Um, I think a lot of us know very well that um, for example, John Holdren played that role a lot throughout Obama's years. Um, and it's not really clear yet whether Trump views Dr. Drogemeyer as taking on that role. So that will be something really interesting to see um, when hopefully his nomination actually does go through. Um, so this is just an overview of Dr. Drogemeyer's um, kind of academic career, I'll say. Um, but I think the quote at the top really personifies um, how he views himself and I think also the approach he'll take of the, at, um, at OSDP. So he says, I'm a scientist, I'm a storm chaser, and I'm an educator. Um, and just a couple of other things to note, kind of other positions he's had over the years. Um, so Dr. Drogemeyer served on the National Science Board under both Republican and Democratic presidencies. Um, and he is a very active Sooner, um, and he serves currently in the governor's office and at the University of Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Um, and he also has private sector experience, which I think um, I think Republicans also really love um, as well, and probably made him a um, a great candidate for the role of OSTP under Trump's administration. Um, and so here are some quotes from Dr. Drogemeyer over time that I think touch on some of his important views for science. Um, so the first quote is in response to someone asking him about his climate change beliefs. He's largely deflected any questions about climate change. So if confirmed, it'll be interesting to see what actions, if any, he takes concerning climate change. Um, and the second quote is important in recognizing that science is an international endeavor. Um, 
but at the same time recognizing that as head of OSTP, you know, his priority would be to ensure American leadership in science. Um, but I think given some of the rhetoric we've seen um, and some of the issues with, um, I'll say, China and also Russia as of late um, in terms of dealing with NASA, I think that's an, um, it's a great quote to see him recognizing that science is a global endeavor. Um, and the final quote touches on something that has seemed to be called into question as of late, um, the role of science in policymaking. And so here you can see he's reaffirming that science is important to inform informing policy, but also that science should be done without political interference. Um, so during his confirmation hearing before the Senate Commerce Science Transportation Committee, um, Dr. Drogemeyer outlined three priorities. Innovative public academic private partnerships that move research quickly into the economy, a whole of government approach to science and technology initiatives, and three, improving education for the future. And through these priorities, Dr. Drogemeyer hopes to continue American leadership in science. If you're interested in learning more about Dr. Dr. Drogemeyer, you can actually view his nomination questionnaire and nomination hearing testimony on the Senate Commerce, Science, and Transportation website. Um, and you can also watch the hearing in its entirety as well. Um, so Dr. Drogemeyer's nomination actually moved pretty quickly um, from being nominated to kind of being confirmed by the committee, um, and it received very bipart strong bipartisan support. Um, the chair of the committee, um, Senator Soon, said Drogemeyer is eminently qualified for the position and urged quick action on his nomination. And similarly, ranking member um, Senator Nelson agreed that Dr. Drogemeyer is highly qualified for the position and went on to say, I think a lot of us on this committee are going to be happy that you are the White House Science Advisor. Um, which might seem funny because he has not actually been confirmed by the Senate yet. Um, but his nomination is actually on hold for two reasons right now. One is the simple fact that the Senate's on recess and not conducting any business until after the election. And then two, Due to Senate procedural rules, any senator can put a hold on a nomination, and it can often be for unrelated reasons, which I suspect is the reason here. So in November, it'll be interesting to see if Dr. Drogemeyer's nomination moves forward, um, although I strongly suspect he'll be confirmed by the end of this Congress or very early in the next Congress. Um, so how can you engage? Um, well, one, you can encourage your senator to appoint a science advisor, because um, it's been a bit concerning that since Trump was elected, there's been no head of OSTP, so going on almost two years now. Um, and if you support Dr. Drogemeyer, you can specifically ask your senator to support his nomination as well. Um, and you can also just stay up to date on what OSTP is working on um, by checking out their website which kind of lists their latest initiatives um, and projects, which often go through multiple stages of public comments um, and hear, not hearings per se, but public proceedings um, that you can engage in. Um, and you can also follow them on Twitter. They're pretty active. Um, and on their website, they also have an email form for stakeholder engagement. So if they're working on a project that you're interested in being a part of or engaging on, you can definitely reach out to them. Um, yeah, and I think that's all I have. So we'll move now to questions, if anyone has any questions. Um, just in case anyone's typing out a question really quick, I'll mention that um, at fall meeting this year, the science policy team is going to be having its own room. Um, I think it's just called the science policy room. So please come find us. Um, we'll have a whole week of programming, um, lots of training, lots of networking opportunities, um, and opportunities to hear from congressional staff as well as members of Congress. Um, additionally, we'll be doing a congressional visit this year. Um, we have about 135 AGU members signed up, so we're very excited um, to help people meet with their legislators um, and take advantage of being in D.C. this year. 
for fall meeting. Um, so we do have a question. Um, we were asked, can you reach out to both Shelby and Moran if not from the state? Um, that's a great question. I I can start this off and then um, if you guys want to jump in, feel free. Um, I would say most definitely, especially if um, you work on research that um, is very applicable to their committees. Um, and what you can do, if you're not from the state, um, you don't have to meet with their personal office staff, you can meet with the committee staff. So, um, you know, Senator Moran has special staffers that only work on the CJS jurisdiction, and they are not all from Kansas, um, they're from all over the country, and they really want to hear from the experts in these issue areas and they want to hear about how funding decisions are affecting everyone across the country because they're really creating federal legislation so i think you know if you're a scientist from kansas that's like hitting the the bingo for their office but if you just have um some level of scientific expertise or experience of how these funding decisions affect you then um, you're the perfect person to be talking to appropriations staff um, I will also mention that during appropriations season, season, all members of Congress, so senators and representatives, take appropriations requests. Um, and even if you don't have a specific number in mind, um, you can just tell them you want to increase funding or to support, support strong funding for a program. Um, and so during the winter is normally kind of the time to reach out to offices and tell them that you support these programs. Um, and often, a lot of members of Congress actually have forms on their website as well. Um, okay, it looks like we have another question on if professional scientific organizations like AGU put together lists of potential candidates to work at OSTP. Um, I don't believe that we do. Uh, if you're thinking like potential like nominees, like for Drogemeyer's position, we do not endorse or I would say like reject nominees. Uh, we really only comment on, you know, their scientific experience and things of that nature. We don't, AGU um, does not ever officially and formally endorse nominees that are Senate confirmed positions. Um, and I will say it's been my experience um, that I will, I'll say under the Obama administration, I know they pulled a lot of people in from different agencies. Um, was more my experience, if you're just talking about working at OSTP. Mm -hmm. um, depending on what they were working on, they might um, borrow someone from NOAA. I know they borrowed people from NOAA and NASA to work on the Space Weather Action Plan, for instance. Yes. You're welcome. Uh, okay, we have another question. I'm a little confused. Uh, Bonnie, I might ask for some clarification here. Um, she asks, now that natural gas is so cheap, do senators who support American energy independence have less interest in renewable energy? Uh, that's a tough question. We don't really comment on issues of like energy and regulations with energy. So I can't really say that I have like a super informed answer for that question. <laughs> I mean, I think, yeah, I apologize for not knowing more about like kind of the politics of energy in Alabama, but I think we still hear a lot about renewable energy. Um, I think we're hearing less about it in this administration, but I know members of Congress are still talking about it. Um, I'm just thinking of someone running for governor right now who still, I think there are a number of cities and states still trying to go 100% renewable energy by certain deadlines. So I don't think that conversation has stopped. Yeah, and I think we definitely still go into offices where like some of their top priorities are talking about renewable energy. So it's certainly still a conversation happening on the Hill. I definitely don't think, you know, the price of natural gas has really driven down that interest. You're welcome. Um, any other questions? Um, oh. Um, okay, we have one. 
how does AGU communicate science without taking sides towards one political scientific branch and their views or another? Um, for instance, how does EGU advertise global climate change without interfering with political issues and the voters? Um, I would say, oh, sorry, can you scroll back up? Um, I would say that we uh, really stick to, uh, when we do congressional meetings on the Hill, um, our really big position is that we just encourage members of Congress and their staff to focus on the science of the decisions that they're making. We don't really tell them what they should do policy-wise. We just tell them that they should listen to the science when making decisions. So it's actually not quite that difficult for us to kind of toe that line because we're not, we're not um, advising them on what they should do one way or another when it comes to things like regulation and specific policy things. Um, I don't know if that gets at your question, Shannon. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and you would be, um, you, I think you would be surprised maybe at, because um, I'm just reading the second half of your question about how to talk about things like climate change without interfering with political issues and voters in a particular district. Um, even though folks may vote a specific way in a district, sometimes you'll go into meetings with offices that you think are not going to be very friendly to the science, and they are still very open-minded and accept the scientific consensus. It just may be politically um, not palatable to their constituency, which is unfortunate, but it's just an interesting dynamic. Yeah, and I think also, too, talking about the issues related to climate change that they might be facing. For instance, um, many southern states um, are always going to have a conversation about sea level rise um, or more extreme weather, even if they might not be ha willing to have a face-on conversation about climate change, I would say. Yeah, there's definitely a trend right now in offices that feel like they can't politically talk about the causes of climate change. They're talking about the the impacts and talking about building houses on stilts instead of a carbon tax. You know, that's that's a very different conversation, but it is moving the needle in the right direction. Um, any other questions? Well, thank you all again for joining us today. Thank you again for joining us. Oh, um, yes. Yes, this webinar is recorded, um, and so you can view it later. It should, and I believe you should receive an email with the recording um, within a couple days, if not tomorrow. Well, thank you guys again for joining us, and please come Find us at fall meeting. Um, we'll be happy to talk with you more in person there, um, but also to you can hear from other experts and not just us. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.